minutos de nuestro programa El Saludo desde Perú. Adelante Lima. In the early 80s, Peru grappled with terrorist groups and government corruption. In 85, sensing the chaos, we left for the U.S. I didn't anticipate that relocating to the U.S. at nine would cause lasting hidden trauma, but it did. To enhance mindfulness, my therapist suggested reconnecting with the Pacific Ocean. My old childhood anchor and friend, now further north. My trips to the Oregon coast always had a way of rekindling nostalgic sentiments within me. Then I realized that these sentiments were closely tied to another crucial event that unfolded on these same shores in 1985. A kid's adventure movie custom made for a kid that needed to escape. I remember having a connection with one character in particular, Data, played by Ki Hui Kwan, struck a chord. A foreigner like me, embraced by his American friends. A reflection of my longing. I also shared this sentiment about the movie's setting. I remember thinking that if there ever was a place where real pirates would hide their treasure, this surely must be it. And it was now my new backyard. The rugged beauty of this enchanted coast awakened and blurred the lines between magic and reality. Then it all faded, like all memories do. Adult life had distanced me away from this nostalgic memory, and I had lost my sense of direction, my sense of home, until 2022. Historic find on Oregon's coast, timber from a 300-year-old Spanish galleon was found in a sea cave. We're out along the Manzanita coast today where archaeologists are continuing to piece together information about a discovery made last week in the waters off the Oregon coast. Someone tipped them off about the wreckage of a ship near a cave and they took advantage of a low tide to go out and take a look. These headlines unexpectedly filled me with a profound sense of nostalgic joy. It's as if the enchantment of possibility had returned. Maybe, just maybe, there's genuine magic out there. Some undiscovered wonder, waiting for my sanity. I needed to believe. Then, an email from an old acquaintance not seen in years, with a subject line that I can only describe as a real call to adventure. Real Goonies, it read. And it was sent to me in hopes I could help document a story about lost treasure and the people searching for it. I then found myself one in part of an ongoing story about discovering that place of enchantment that still exists somewhere out there somewhere beyond maps and legends, somewhere beyond the secrets of the mysteries. I was always a big fan 
of, I was one of those kids who would go to the library after school or during library period in elementary school and I'd find the supernatural books, you know, the paranormal ones about Loch Ness Monster and UFOs and this time it was like mid late 1970s. So they always had these really cool like Time Life books covers, right, or ESP. I don't know what happened to ESP. People don't really talk about it anymore, but you know, that was a big thing. So there was a lot of a lot of love for the supernatural and what I like to do was go through and look at the pictures because to me those pictures were just so intriguing I mean I didn't care about whether they were real or not I cared about just how much they kind of invite you into that world of like the what if my name is JB Fisher I'm a college professor I'm also a writer in Portland I like to write about Oregon history especially just kind of weird forgotten unknown stories or things that you think you might know about but you actually don't know as much as you kind of want to think you do. I mean, I got into it in a weird way because, you know, I was a Shakespeare professor and then I became a history writer when I came back to Oregon and I found these newspapers about this missing family in my garage. So that was kind of like a weird thing that got me on a totally different path than I thought I would be on out here. Yeah, I started researching about this missing family, you know, what happened to them. They disappeared in the Columbia Gorge and I was trying to figure out if the case had been solved. And then I went down this rabbit hole, getting a hold of the main detectives files on the case and that opened up this whole world not just of that case but a bunch of other cases about crimes that he was trying to solve and couldn't back in the 1950s so that kind of got me into this whole world where you know when you're in like a bookstore and you see books next to the one that you want and you're sort of like oh i came here for that one but this one over here is really cool and so i started like you know you just kind of notice something else and that happens a lot when you're researching newspaper archives especially you might or police reports you might find like mention of some other case or some person and be like wow what's that all about so that was a long process when i when i that book about the missing family took about seven years to write and during that time i wrote another book with jd chandler we wrote a book called portland on the take about some other cases that that same detective Detective Walter Graven was involved with back in the 50s. So we wrote that book in between, and that's around the time that I met Doug and really got into the history stuff. And that's because I started going to these history talks that Doug was doing over at the Jack London Bar. And so I went over there, kind of got in with a crowd of, of Oregon historians. Uh, and because I was working on this project about this missing family, I had like my own weird story to tell. And then that got me into all these other uh, all these other projects as well. My mom would go to Goodwill and she would buy me like 19 cent used paperbacks of like Bermuda Triangles and Yetis in the Himalaya and shit like that. You know, and I would just devour this stuff, you know, remote viewing and astral projection. And I just loved it. She'd give me these 19 cent little, little used paperbacks and I'd pour through those at like age 10 or 11 in like a day or two. I just couldn't get enough of them. And so that what really got me obsessed with this kind of paranormal and Loch Ness monsters and UFOs and our Sasquatches really running the television networks and things like that. When I started doing these history talks, you know, we were kind of free to pick whatever topics we wanted. And I don't remember exactly why I started looking at Neocani treasure hunters. I think it probably was kind of a a little bit of back and forth where Doug and I had started talking about some of the different aspects, you know, some of the ins and outs of the whole story. Our interest in this story kind of led us to field trips, you know, and ended up giving joint presentations at different venues around town and so on. I was at the shipwreck conference in Astoria at the Columbia River Maritime Museum out there. Uh, and they, I heard a bit more about Scott Williams, the archeologist talking about it uh, beforehand. But yeah, when they discovered the, the timbers, you know, it was really kind of when this got brought back together. And then Aaron from the Willamette Week, one of the editors there contacted me and he wanted me to kind of, uh, not necessarily write an article, but kind of negotiate the interview that would then get turned into an article. Kind of everybody was writing about that story, you know, and it was a real kind of Goonies tie-in was the hook that everybody went. And, you know, JB and I, I were talking about it after that article appeared and we we're like you know we really there's more to this story than just oh and this is the goonies you know there's more going on here what really got for me was when i got in touch with the family of ed fire because ed fire's family was willing to share what they knew about the story and they knew some stuff that was like totally out there and totally different from anything that you'd read about the whole treasure story 
So that really fascinated me because that really clicked with my interest in pursuing some aspect of the story that people just truly don't know about. To get to know this mystery, we must travel back to the beginning. The Oregon coast was born from volcanic fury. Somewhere around eastern Oregon, eons ago. A relentless force of nature as molten rock surged forth from the depths, sculpting the very bones of this enchanting coastline. As the fiery lava met the relentless waves of the Pacific, it cooled and solidified into dramatic rock formations giving rise to the rugged beauty that defines the Oregon coast. Her craggy sea stacks and towering cliffs rise majestically from the shoreline, where dense forests meet the edge of the world. Lewis and Clark came out to the mouth of the Columbia River in November of 1805. And when you look at it during that time and several hundred years earlier, that was the least explored area of the world, except for the Poles. So that area was really unknown. And in 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, you knew the coastline of the rest of the world, and you're starting to develop it in what we now know as the Pacific Northwest, but it was not set in stone at that point. This was really an unknown, it was a mystery. And if you wanted to keep a secret, this would be the place where you would do it. Astoria would have been at pretty much the next San Francisco if it wasn't for the Columbia Bar. You know, basically, the graveyard of the Pacific just makes a mess of things trying to get in and out of the, basically, out of Astoria, which, is, you know, if you've been to Astoria, it's a beautiful, sprawling bay that really could have been the San Francisco of the North, but it's too dangerous. I mean, it's a very rocky area. The Pacific Ocean is just a monster. The Columbia River before the dams was like a fire hose just shooting out this six mile wide entrance. And it was just, it was just death. In many, many cases, it's a river of death. So you've got Lewis and Clark, they come out in 1805, they leave in 1806. And then in 1811, John Jacob Astor's party comes out here. And that's a mainly American led party. And they come to the mouth of the Columbia River. And that's where they set up a fort named Fort Astoria. So from right then, these stories of this treasure legend come onto our actual journaled article right? Some of the documentary evidence that we have are tales of this treasure. So John Jacob Astor was the first major figure to really be associated with this treasure hunting and that partly was because there was sort of a lore surrounding a trip that he took, a pack trip into the Nehalem, the so-called Nehalem country and came back with his pack animals laden with lots of heavy stuff, no one really knew what it was, and there was sort of suspicion that that's how he made his money, that he'd actually found the treasure, never mind that he, of course, had, had established his fur empire before this, and actually didn't travel by pack animals, so there's sort of rumors swirling about all of this, but that's kind of where it starts, and then in the 1860s, it really takes off, because that's when we have a, uh, 1865 is when we have Will Snyder plowing his fields, hitting on, this mysterious 200 pound rock with the W and the DE, uh, which really, of course, fuels a lot of imagination and very quickly additional rocks are found.
Good evening. Welcome to Digging Up the Past. I'm Bonnie Mills, your host for tonight. Our subject for tonight's show is going to be something that's been in the news quite a bit all over the United States, and that's shipwrecks. Only we're going to talk about shipwrecks specifically on the Oregon coast and in general on our northwest coast. So Dr. Woodward, I'd like to start with you, and can you kind of give us an overview of shipwrecks on the Oregon coast? Well, of course, there are many historically documented shipwrecks right up to the present time. Uh, but what is particularly fascinating to uh, archaeologists are the shipwrecks uh, for which there are no, or is no documentation. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, legends and we have archaeological evidence of shipwrecks occurring, uh, European shipwrecks, uh, possibly Asian watercraft, um, being wrecked on our shores um, during perhaps the 16th century, or conceivably even earlier. And of course we have no direct documentation of the names of these ships, and so the evidence that we have has to be obtained uh, other ways. This is a piece of beeswax, which is found on the Halem Spit. This is part of the cargo, we believe, of Manila Galleon. So what do they think these marks are? Uh, shippers' marks, most likely. Why would they be shipping beeswax? Was this a, a, a commodity that was worth a lot of money at the time? It was. It was part of the cargo of the Manila Galleons from Manila to Acapulco. The ch church used a lot of the beeswax. And... Oh, oh, okay. So they were transporting it from the Orient to the New right. World. And this is a smaller piece of the this wax? This is a smaller piece, yes. This is about what they find now. You'll see something like this on the beach. A lot of people pass it by thinking it's a rock. And then the early settlers in the Halem would go over and plow for it or dig it up and then they would melt it down and sell it to Portland to a seed company out here. We went over and talked to a fellow that had found a rock as late as uh, 1947 and this he told me it was found on a mound of stones. Uh, we looked at it um, it had 1632 carved on it mm. in a triangle and after a few trips they found out it was found on a mound of stones 10 foot in diameter two foot high. And it ended up that if you went 1,632 yards north, you came to the north mound, which is 10 foot in diameter, two foot high. And along one side, falling down a stone, which was well, 16, 17 inches long, but it had a groove up one side across the top and down the other side exactly 36 inches, which was a measurement. And this is rock here at the base here is the one that was come from a triangulation point. It looks like, we call it the A rock, it looks like an A on one side, but it's basically where the lines came in to a point. So they were using it for some kind of a survey? It was. This is what we've come up with. It is a survey. So somebody <laughs> surveying to see how, maybe how tall the mountain is, and then we end up with a treasure story? Is that, is that possible, John? I don't know where the treasure comes in here. Wayne, Wayne knows more about that. I, I don't think there is any treasure. I think it's lovely folklore. For a long time, archaeologists were a bit reluctant to become involved with uh, northern Tillamook County because of the treasure stories and the folklore. But uh, we now know that uh, uh, the folklore is one issue, but there is a conclusive evidence of prehistoric shipwrecks there and of whether there's any treasure or not is a whole another issue right. and, and the treasure to us is discovering the history of, of what happened there not to some probably imaginary gold bars. So when we get to the late 19th century is when we really start to hear circulating the various accounts that basically come down to the idea that there were uh, three winged canoes out on the water that were witnessed by indigenous peoples. They were blowing smoke at one another. Uh, one of the ships sank. One of them came to shore, and then crew members came off the ship and carried a uh, chest up the mountain, buried the chest, as well as a black person with the chest, which is always a kind of strange, intriguing, problematic part of the story, of course. Uh, but also one that is very much with the account through the various incarnations. Essentially, that idea of the uh, burying the chest with a body on top was oftentimes in media, say in the late 19th and early 20th century, was oftentimes uh, understood as this would be a way to protect the treasure 
when it came to say superstitions and fears about the ideas of, of burying a body with with the chest, right? But this is also, of course, pirate stuff, which when we're talking about the same era, the late 19th century is also when there was a lot of other stuff swirling around, right? Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson, lots of other kinds of accounts. So there's also this, I think again, sort of um, fair pushback against these treasure stories that says, hey, you know, this is like, popular stuff, right? People love treasure stories. It's not, didn't start with the Goonies, right? And so people got excited about it. It was a way to sell newspapers, get people to come to Manzanita. So basically, when we're talking about the Manila Galleon and we're talking, let's say 1693, we're talking about an event that was witnessed by onlookers and those onlookers were Clatsop and uh, Nahalem peoples who were living on the coast basically with a front row seat to whatever was going on on, on the coast and in the ocean. So the account, which is oftentimes presented as, at this point, at least in, among historians and archeologists, rightfully so, as the wreck of the Manila Galleon is usually described mostly in terms of what uh, indigenous people found, the beeswax uh, and other kinds of materials that washed up on shore, right? But as far as the account of a ship or some ships showing up, winged canoes as it's sometimes described, this issue of blowing smoke at each other, sounding like a battle, right? Ships wash, coming to shore, chests being buried. All of that oftentimes among historians and archeologists is sort of kept separate, right? Because it's like, we don't have any proof. We don't know what that event or those events were. So most of the time people come back to, it's just, there's the Manila Galleon that wrecked in the 17th century, lost its contents, and that's what we're seeing in terms of eyewitness accounts. But I think it's very important not to rule out the possibility of other accounts. One of the things about oral tradition, of course, is that it's incredibly nebulous, right? It changes and shapes and shifts in lots of ways. And oftentimes, today, there's kind of a tendency to say, well, it was all important and, and reliable until the settlers got here, and then all of a sudden it's like fable and fantasy. And that might be true, right? There might be ways in which settlers got really excited, maybe overexcited and started looking around for things that they were sort of taking literally that maybe were not necessarily meant to be taken as such. But, but I'm a believer in the, the fact that an eyewitness account is going to include factual information. And so that idea of people coming and, and burying something in the ground, that came from indigenous witnesses and I just don't think it's fair to say, okay, we can kind of write some of those off and not others and kind of pick and choose. I mean, certainly we don't have the same hard evidence if we find the treasure, we will, but we don't have the same hard evidence as the beeswax, right? But we do still have the legacy of these accounts, right? And those accounts I think are really important to us um, as an indicator, A, of the complexity of the story and B, of the fact that we can't really pick and choose in terms of like who, who we can consider automatically reliable and not in this, in this case. It's just a great story. It, it's, uh, everybody likes stories about lost treasure, but this is one of the most convoluted, strange stories that goes back more centuries than most tales that I can think about. The Spaniards had the world's longest lasting commercial route ever. It lasts from 1555 to, six, to 1850, 250 years running galleons from Acapulco to Manila, and then, then from Manila back to Acapulco. And what they did was they loaded them up with silver from Potosi and, and probably Tosco in Acapulco. They put two, three, sometimes maybe even four million silver pesos, these things, and, and they would send them to Manila. Silver had the approximate value of gold at the time, so the Spaniards could, I don't know, 20 times up the value of this silver in the gold, and then they would spend it. You know, they'd order these things, it would be Ming China, they'd order lacquerware, they'd order silks, they would order, I'm sure, gold crosses and pendants and scabbards and the jewel encrusted things, and all the ecclesiastical wear in all of the uh, Spanish cathedrals all over Western South America and Mexico. So if you go into the cathedral in Mexico City or Lima or Bogota. All the ecclesiastical wear was made in China in the 1600s and 1700s. The problem with this was, was getting home. It was a terrible voyage. They're riding a storm front 
basically from the Japanese coast where they'd be murdered if they landed on the Japanese coast because Japanese didn't want outsiders, all the way to back to North America. They didn't have, and it was a long, tough, dangerous voyage. And they didn't have the technology for it. And they didn't, the sails would fall apart. They didn't have the food storage. They didn't have water storage. And if something went wrong on that trip, the only choice they had was just deadhead to the North American coast and see if they could run aground. Near Connie Mountain is the highest point within hundreds of miles in any direction. So you can weave a story of the, something happened in the Burgos at sea and just homing in on Neo County Mountain and then running around. What happened to the men on the ship after that is a matter of legend from the Indians because none of them apparently ever made it back to Mexico City or Acapulco. Remember, the treasure went in the other direction. The treasure went from America to the Philippines. What came back was manufactured goods. Now, some of those were pretty valuable manufactured goods, you can imagine. Plates for churches, uh, crosses, icons, and, uh, and, a lot, and a lot of personal stuff. And they weren't allowed to check baggage the way we are on planes, but they were allowed a small container, I'm saying like half a cubic foot or something, which if they had just gotten their hands on, as they probably did a lot of times, you know, jewels and pieces of gold and things, they would have brought them back in their own personal luggage and, and sold to the sailors. Captains weren't terribly honest, and they probably had a lot of unmanifested stuff you know, actually in the hold. Now, why it was off the Oregon coast, I have no idea. It is so far from their path. When you go from Manila to the west coast of what is today the United States, and you follow those that normal trade path, you're gonna end up south of San Francisco. And then you're gonna sail on down the coast until you get to Acapulco. There's really no reason at all that you would be this far north. I mean, I can't imagine those men staggering ashore from a, the kind of thing they would have had to have survived. I mean, sometimes nobody survived at all. There's a story of one ship that made it to Acapulco and didn't stop. And the Acapulco people were sent out of boats and everybody on the ship was dead. They shipwrecked there and it's raining and it's dark. They've survived. For some reason, that ship had a catastrophic event and ends up on the Oregon coast. And I mean, what are you gonna do? I mean, you're, you're fucked. I mean, you're really fucked in that situation. So, you know, maybe they gathered together all of the valuable things that were on board the ship at that time, the personal belongings of the folks that were along as passengers, you know, maybe the gold and silver that the officers might have had, uh, the, pay, the silver pesos that the soldiers had that were on board. You gather all of that together and you put that in a box and you bury it underneath that mountain so you can find it later when you come back. And religious sacraments, I mean, things like, you put that box that I'm describing in the sand for over 200 years, that's fucking treasure. I mean, we're not talking about holds filled with emeralds and strings of pearls and ingots of silver and gold. I mean, Ed Fire thought he, he was. No, I'm not necessarily talking about that, but the archeologists, they say, there's no treasure associated with that shipwreck. And I say, bullshit, bullshit. The personal belongings that those people had on board, you dig a hole and you put them in the ground for a few hundred years, that's fucking treasure. Well, they really treasure hunter was a man named Hiram Smith, who was one of the earliest pioneers to come into Oregon. I mean, he uh, got a track of land at the foot of Neoconi Mountain, and one day plowed up a rock, flipped it over, and on the back there were Latin letters and what, Christ what looked like Christian crosses and a picture of an arrow. Hiram spent the rest of his life looking for the box. Uh, never found it. But he had a son, Pat Smith, who would come on the wagon train with him. Who, who, maybe he didn't have enough land to divide among us. Anyway, he raised Pat as a treasure hunter rather than as a farmer. Pat took correspondence courses in how pirates would have buried treasure. I don't know how you get a course like that, but in engineering, he figured it out. And then he learned Spanish because, it, because the thought was, even at that early age, there was, it was a Spanish ship that had been wrecked out there. And Pat Smith, 
was the son of Hiram Smith, who was a pioneer. And Pat Smith was really, really geeking out, <laughs> for lack of a better term, on the prospects of finding this treasure. So he took surveying courses. He um, married a, an older woman of the Clatsop peoples. Um, and many kind of wondered if he had kind of some other motiv motivations with that. He learned Spanish and Portuguese. He did a lot of a lot of prep, and then he also found some really intriguing things. He found additional marked rocks. He found teak wood that he then proceeded to make furniture out of. Uh, that was the wreck of some ship. It may not be the same ship. Obviously, more than one ship is wrecked in these parts. But nevertheless, he proceeded to make some very fine furniture, walking sticks and chairs and other things with it. Sometime, I believe in uh, 1890s, he then went to Spain, to, the, to Seville, where they have the archives of the Indies. In a monument to human perspicacity, <laughs> Smith came back to Oregon with a list of 14 ships that had disappeared, Manila, Manila guys that disappeared from Philippines on the way back to Acapulco. Who knows how much any of this is true, but this is what Pat Smith said. So Pat Smith died and he didn't find the treasure. Uh, and then his successors, Charlie Pike, Milo Merrill, they went at it for a long time, like into the, from like the beginning of the 20th century all the way to like the 1950s. Um, and there were others as well who invested lots and lots of money and time, Dean Grimes and Lloyd Grimes and some others in the 1960s and 70s who really spent a lot of time, especially just digging big holes. Right? And that's the main thing is they would dig these sort of like the, uh, the, the Oak Island stuff. You know, it's all about getting a big, deep hole out there and see what, what comes out of it, right? Then everything kind of settles down in the, in the 50s for a while. Early 50s, Milo Merrill and Charlie Pike kind of wrap their business up, run out of money, basically. Other people have picked up the trail and gotten involved. These, these are not sober pioneer types. These are the local psycho who is no longer allowed to pitch his tent on the sidewalks in Portland. So he's gone to Neocani Mountain and convinced himself that the Ark of the Covenant or the Tree of Life or something is buried in the mountain. This was one of the guys, one of, the, one of these was the guy that I wound up representing, trying to get him back on the beach. I got involved in a very peripheral kind of way with this. Back in the, when I was starting out as a, young lawyer in the 80s. I worked for a gentleman who uh, died, and I took over some of his cases. And one of the cases was representing a treasure hunter on uh, at Near County Mountain on, at Manzanita, who was just convinced that he knew where the treasure was. In fact, he had been within a foot or so of having it in his grasp, digging it up when he was kicked off the beach because he didn't own the beach. Nobody owns the beach. Beach belongs to the state of Oregon. And he, he had a, I think he had a permit to dig for a while. He got caught, or so the state thought, running a backhoe out there in the middle of the night. He was convinced he was within a foot of finding the, not just a life-changing treasure, treasure that would have changed the whole economic reality of the United States of America if he had just gotten one more scoop with that backhoe. And he'd been suing like for 15 years. The state wasn't having any of this. The state has owned the beach since around 1910 or 12, and Governor Oswald West, who was governor, who defeated Jay Bowerman to governor. Jay Bowerman went on to be Bill Bowerman, the track coach in Oregon's father. West uh, was governor. He was a liberal, progressive Democrat at the time. So he was in favor of good roads, one of his road projects was to confiscate the beach, the entire beach for the whole state of Oregon, so he could build a road to California, which is just, you know, anything about cars and beaches, it's just loony. But having some point figured this out, he built Highway 101 instead, but he never gave the beach back. So Oregon, as far as I know, I could not know, it's the only state in the country where a beach up to the high water mark belongs to the state which means anything found out there belongs to the state, with some exceptions. An exception would be if it happened to be a Manila treasure galleon that Spain owned and thinks they still owned, even though it's now in Oregon waters.
remember what they said in Seaside. Remember what? The beaches in Oregon are public highways. You can drive almost all the way to Astoria, but watch for the wreck of the Peter Iridell. That's the marker where you turn inland. So, where's the wreck? Going to the Oregon coast, you've always heard about like the Neocon treasure to some degree, or you've heard about pirate treasure. So I remember as a teenager going to the coast and hearing about treasure, but I didn't have the specific story associated with the Neocani treasure until I bought this book at Goodwill, Ruby L. Holt's Treasure Hunting Northwest. <laughs> So one of the people who reads that book is a Salem house painter uh, who birth name was Ed Fire. But at the time he was going by the name Tony Marino, apparently to protect his family. And he'd done some other prospecting over in Arizona at the uh, Lost Dutchman mine. He came to Oregon, learned about Neocani Mountain and then like really never looked back. Tony Marino was big in the press. I mean, you know, the Washington Post wrote about him. I mean, it was a big story. Tony, when do you intend to start digging over on the coast? Wednesday. How much treasure, what would be the value of it, do you suppose? But there were four boxes that were buried. Yes. It took seven men to carry one box. And it was uh, $4,500,000 per box. That was, uh, let's say, 200 years ago. Yes. The value has tripled. So this could hit a million dollars. I mean a billion. A billion dollars. A billion dollars. A billion dollars. possibilities. Uh, I've seen men go after things for less. And this happens a lot. Every day, it's not done legally, and it's not done by the state, because they don't want to take yes. and hurt their image. Right. Well, what is my image? <laughs> it is what I do. It's what I can do. I'm not the perfect, I'm not a perfect man. I wish I was. You have a very uh, uh, great assurance in your own mind that this treasure is there. Well, if I didn't, would I be here? <laughs> That's right. If I didn't have the persistence and the positive thinking, would I be here? He was an intense individual. Um, he was uh, very intense. Uh, he, I think he was bipolar. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, he was, and he, he did some harsh things. You know, you hear about uh, child abuse and spousal abuse, and he was the epitome of that. He was very physical. Uh, very um, angry. <laughs> he kind of taught us how to steal shit. Um, you know, one time he broke into an ice cream van that was parked at his service station, Canyon Country, which was Mint Canyon, and where we lived. And we, you know, learned how to steal things. He, him and my my uncle he, David used to play around on the uh, broke down um, ships in the bay in New York, tankers and stuff that were, you know, no longer used. And he went into the uh, inside of one and was mon monkeying around down there and by himself. And the hatch closed with a slam. And it was, he said it was pitch black in there. And he started hollering for help. He heard this voice and uh, he said, Eddie, I said, uh, I'm gonna get you out of here but um, there's something that I'm gonna want you to do for me later. And his dad, my dad said, he said, okay, I don't care anything, get me out of here. And the door opened and he'd come out and all that. It could have been the devil, it could have been 
you know, some spiritual thing, obviously. That's my conclusion. Um, I, I don't know. I really have no idea. But I've heard that story from him uh, many times in my life. I don't know what, what it was that sparked his initial uh, interest in this treasure hunt thing. Uh, but when he did, he went in with both feet. Those early treasure hunters were still, they were looking at Neocani Mountain. And that's where they were searching for this. And I find it really interesting when Ed Fire decides that he's gonna look down on the beach in Manzanita rather than up there on the mountain as so many of uh, kind of his, um, his mentors had. I, I remember us driving down there to the beach. We drove down there and we looked at these stones and stuff and he was coming up with these ideas and whatnot. And he ends up running a... Uh, a little D4 cat uh, and put, puts it on a trailer and takes it down there. You know, at first he says he's looking for his watch, you know, and he's, he's digging and he's got a big bulldozer down there then. And they say, no, 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 you can't do this. You have to file for the permit. When they, when they started getting all this equipment and stuff, there came a point where you can't do this without a permit of some kind on a, on a public beach or public land. And so the fellow, I don't know his name, that owned the company that I was just speaking of, his daughter was the uh, private secretary for Tom McCall. And so through the back door they go, <laughs> uh, through Tom McCall and get this treasure trove bill passed. Um, at the time they were calling it the Merino bill, I think they changed it. They basically passed what was called the Tony Marino Treasure Trove Bill, and it gave him an unprecedented claim to a much larger percentage of the treasure than was previously offered to people. So somehow he wrangled that, and included in the Treasure Trove Bill was also unprecedented digging rights for Tony Marino. Something like seven miles of the beach was open for him to dig. So I feel pretty confident that Ed Fire did have a personal relationship with Governor Tom McCall. And essentially McCall was helping him out because McCall thought it was good for Oregon to bring tourism here. But there were a lot of people involved in this thing, man. And uh, there's a fellow that we were looking in that film a minute ago, the one with the hard hat on that's walking around in that film. But he was a, uh, he was an old miner. And uh, he's the one that built the coffer dams or come up with the, the idea for the copper dams to build those and then to dig and they would go down and put another one on top and that would go down and build another one on top and they built three of those. I think they were seven feet tall. My dad sold shares, a lot of shares, at $1,000 a share. And all of a sudden we're driving a new Ford LTD fastback and living high on the hog, you know, and a painter, you know, contractor, you know, you don't buy that kind of stuff. At one point he was doing something and uh, some some dudes in suits came down to the rope and started to, and came over the rope. And he went over and said, what are you doing in here? And he, and he goes, well, uh, I'm the mayor and this is the chief of police and we're here because, and he said, I don't give a shit why you're here. And he punched the mayor and lifted him up over the rope. There was no repercussions for any of that because they were trespassing at that point because he had the rights to do this. So he gets up and he says, look, man, he says, all we wanted to do was get the rope back, you know? So my dad was angry. He got angry really quick. And uh, he just said, okay, you can have it. And, and just started cutting it up into little sections and said, there's your goddamn rope, get out of here. The old man, when he left to go do whatever he did and leave us boys there with a 357 Magnum, so my brother, 16 years old, is walking around with a 357 Magnum on his side, on his hip, you know, running people off. You know? <laughs> they give him shit and say, look, man, we owe seven miles of this beach. Get off the beach, you know? <laughs> after, after the dig started going a while, we stayed at a fellow's house. He was a state police, an Oregon state police. And he became friends with my dad. So we started staying there because he had a big ass house. And it was close to the beach. And he had two daughters. One was about my age, one was about my brother's age. And so we were kind of happy about it. I know, and we'd hang out and do what kids do. 
play around, knock each other around, play smooch, whatever. <clears throat> and uh, one night we weren't there, but uh, his daughter, his oldest daughter, had uh, was sniffing plastic glue and had her Her father service revolver and shot herself on the couch. I think that's why some of this stuff is so embedded in my memory. You know, if you want to remember something, mix it with a bunch of emotion and you'll never forget it. But this thing progresses and uh, he finds these artifacts. We get in death threats at the house, phone calls. And then at one point he finds um, in this dig, in this hole down there about 55 feet or so, 60 feet, 55 feet, some red hair. Probably some of the listeners are not familiar at all with this legend of Jack Ramsey. Maybe we should explain that he was a, uh, a, a red-haired uh, Indian, um, uh, very lightly complected, and, uh, and seemed to be more European in terms of his habits and his understanding of, of English. Uh, and, uh, and certainly stories have, have tried to explain who he was as a, perhaps a survivor of a shipwreck. And I think he was indeed, or the son of a survivor of a shipwreck in about 1790 or 1780. We can go into uh, what was happening at the house during some of this. Uh, some, some spiritual stuff started happening. Um, there was uh, three knocks on the door. You go to the door and nobody there. And it was a very long uh, walkway up to the house. Then the stereo would come on full blast by itself. In the kitchen, the stove was against the wall. And then the space across, and there was a window above the sink. And then there was a door that you could go out. And then you was into a, like a six foot across by say 16, 20 feet long outside kind of a porch all enclosed and the uh, salt and pepper shaker came off the top of the stove and went through that first window and out through the second window and out across the, the, the alleyway and landed over there. At one point, uh, we were sitting, Dad and Mike were down at the, uh, the dig and uh, we were watching a movie. It was actually uh, Betty Davis. Hush, hush, sweet Charlotte. So it's spooky anyway. And uh, <clears throat> the fireplace just ignited and started burning full flame. You know what Presto logs are? Real hard to get lit. Um, but they engulfed in flames and that scared the shit out of us. Um, at one point, we were all watching TV. Dad was in the house at this time. And uh, which is to say he was up from the dig this evening. And he went in the bathroom and he come out all mad and angry, hollering at us going, who the hell did this shit? What, we've been here. What are you talking about? All the towels and stuff were out of the linen in the bathroom, in the tub, and the tub was full of water. And the drawers were out and upside down on the floor in the bathroom. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just kind of weird stuff, man. But it, all this stuff started happening when he started digging for this treasure. This curse has followed everyone that has looked for this treasure. It does not end well. It ends in financial ruin, in death. There was a, a whole lot more that went on. There was a fellow named Will Yost. He was a writer that my dad hired to, to do some writing on the story, on the subject. And uh, I don't know what his uh, you know, credentials were or anything. but. The old man found out that he was trying to, he was going to not, he was going to take the rights of this story. Well, Will Yost got run over with a logging truck in his TR6 sports car, squashed him. I firmly believe there is something up there. I don't know how it's a treasure, but I really do think there is something up there. And I used to have, I had a little used bookstore in town in the back in the 
I bought it from people that started in the late 80s and the very early 90s. And a lot of people would come in that were a different kind of a different kind of people that, you know, I mean, they were kind of looking for something and they'd all, so many of them would say, well, you know, there's a healing energy on the mountain and that's why I'm here. And uh, then they'd tell me about strange things they'd had happen and people that were trained in search and rescue and things like that would go up on that mountain and get lost. And there are strange lights. I've seen, when we, the early years we were here, you, you could look out at night, you could see all sorts of lights bobbing up there around the mountain. And I know people told me, and I ne have never saw this, but I know I had people tell me, oh, you know, you gotta be careful because there's witches coming up there and they go up and celebrate at certain times. And I thought, well, okay. But I have no personal experience with that, so, so. My brother was walking down the beach, Michael, and he said to me, he tells me this story. He said he saw a ball of light out at the end of the, this uh, horizon. And he, and he said he was watching this, and he was walking, and he was watching this light, and the light was getting closer and closer and closer, and he's turning up toward the trailer. And, uh, and the light comes up to the shore, <clears throat> and it forms an image of a one-legged man. What a pirate hat on, you know? <laughs> and uh, my dad's coming back from wherever he was, and my brother's running up the highway as fast as he can go. And he has to turn around and go get him, <clears throat> chase him down, and get him in the car. We had just, we hadn't been in our house very long, so we didn't have any trees or anything around because they take it, took everything out, you know, in those days when they built something. And there wasn't much up here. There was just us and a couple house next door and a couple little cabins. And we hadn't landscaped any, so we were just so we you could see at night with the light on, you could see. And my husband had gone, had to go to a meeting, and I had a little puppy that was trying to housebreak. And so even though it was getting kind of dark, she needed to go out, so I took her out. And she started to just climb my leg and cry and cry. And I thought, well, what's wrong? And then all of a sudden I heard these clump clump, clump, giant footsteps coming up the bank out there. Well, I could see, I mean, it was just sand. There was nothing else. And I thought, didn't think too much more about it, except when my husband got home, I told him about it. So he went out and looked, of course, and he says, well, there's nothing there, you know, but he's learned to believe me over the years. So then later in the night, there was this, well, I woke up and there was this sensation that there was something in the house. And it was this feeling of like energy and you could feel it leave. And I thought, okay. Well, I hadn't known that my friend very long because we hadn't lived here very long. And I thought, well, do I want to say anything to her? No, she'll think I'm crazy. I didn't know at the time then that she was just as crazy as I was. So it was okay. That then a few days later, we kind of were talking. I was, we were both kind of talking around the subject. And I said, you know what? I said, I had something strange happen that day at, at night. And she said, oh, you too? The very same experience. Something moving, giant moving, like, like a giant moving and, and her dogs being upset. And she was braver than me. She went out in the night with a flashlight and walked all around and looked. So then when I had the bookstore, I had more than one person come in. And after the end, because we had the little treasure book on display and they'd get started talking about it and they who'd had the same experience, like camping up there, pulling off in their car and sleeping overnight up there on that pull off, they'd had the same experience. So, you know, there's something there. Either that or there's an awful lot of crazy people. <laughs> it, it's the truth, you know, as I remember it. And it scared the holy shit out of me. I'm still scared of the dark, man. I got a little nightlight over here on the floor all the time. You know, my dog sleep on my bed with me.
still think you're going to find it. I, I believe it's there. I said it was there, and I still think it's there. Well, now, you've come up with uh, quite a few clues over the months, including some recently. This is one of the most dramatic recent clues, as I understand it. Can you tell me about this? Yes, it's a uh, uh, handmade wine cup or dinner cup. How long is it going to be, Tony, before you find the treasure, do you think? Well, uh, that's in God's hands. Uh, it might be a week, it might be two weeks. Right now, we're having bad storms. We've got a steel casing in our shaft now. It's down to 25 feet, and it's pretty well protected. Well, he left the beach because, first of all, he hit what seemed to be bedrock, so he couldn't go any further. And then he also was, um, I think, basically leaving with the anticipation that he could strategize his next move, which was to go up to the mountain. Astoria was really kind of a thriving city for a while, even after the fire, you know, in the 1950s, 1960s. But what happened is that the timber industry declined in Oregon, as well as the salmon fishing and the canning. That community just kind of faced massive depression. And I remember as a kid driving through that area in the 1980s, and like he'd stop off at the Safeway to get something. And that was it. I mean, it was just boarded up. It was tough. That was a tough little spot in the 1980s. The Goonies is sort of always the more consistent draw of people as well as generations that love it. You know, not only the people that saw it initially in the 80s, but their children and their grandchildren have watched this movie. And so I think from a draw, it absolutely is sort of one of the most iconic Oregon movies for sure. And also in the film itself, it identifies itself as a story. So I hate the Goonies. Um, I know that I'm in the minority of almost everyone, but I don't know that I've actually watched The Goonies all the way through. And my problem is the fucking yelling. They just fucking yell the entire time. And it just grates uh, like a rat in the back of my fucking brain. I can't watch that movie. And I have tried over the last year to watch that movie maybe four or five times. But... From the excerpts that I have seen of the Goonies, of the caverns, the tunnels, and so on, it's completely believable. And that is actually what Ed Fire is describing. Sometime in the late 80s, early 90s, he comes back, and now he's known as Ed Fire. Uh, for whatever reason, he no longer uses the Tony Marino name. And he has a, a, one of his kids with him. He has a daughter with him who helps him out. So he comes back to the mountain, he's ready to go, he starts digging, and then he starts finding stuff. And this isn't publicized. And so honestly, one of the things I'm most fascinated about in this whole story is that I really just like to think of that as a puzzle, right? Did Ed Fire inspire the Goonies? Or did the Goonies inspire Ed Fire? Because on the other side of it, you think about this guy who was really, at that point, mid-1980s, probably feeling kind of frustrated. So Ed Fire moves his search from the beach to the mountain. And when I say the mountain, he doesn't move on top of the mountain as many of his predecessors had, but he's kind of down along the base of it. 
And he's finding tunnels. He's finding a network of tunnels. He describes it as 10 acres of tunnels, which is a lot of space. And he says that these tunnels are hewn by man. No, I wasn't around when he started poking around in that mountain, but my brother told me stories about it, and my sister had told me about these these trips that they took up to the mountain, um, where are these are these caves that, at the bottom of the caves where you would walk were were hewn with uh, cedar planks. They went into these tunnels, and you'd have to go up into a tunnel and down into another tunnel, and uh, <clears throat> he. he take pictures as he was going through these things. When he come out, there were images in the pictures. Um, and this is not, not my dad talking to me. This is my brother and my sister talking, telling me these stories. He does get some, some press and that kind of thing, but he doesn't kind of get the fanfare that he wanted. And I know he called the Oregon Historical Society hoping that they would invest in it. So again, I think he's trying to find investors again to get into his, into his schemes to find this treasure. What I remember is it was a phone call. He brought up that he was a treasure hunter and um, that he was having problems. And I want to say that he was worried that he was going to be forced off an Iacani, that he had been, um, that they were, I think they were tired of having him on there. <clears throat> and that he told me that he had found a treasure. And as all things go, you know, I'm always curious. And working by yourself, you get kind of lonely. So you keep the phone call going, well, what? I guess. Um, but I remember him telling me about this treasure, and I said, oh, that's pretty cool. And he um, brought up, like, would the historical society like to sponsor him? And, uh, you know, I take people at face value, and I said, well, you know, they might, but you have to have proof. You know, video cameras were out, photographic cameras. And um, he said that uh, he couldn't, because every time he brought a camera into the chamber, um, it wouldn't record. And so I'm thinking like, okay. And he, at some point, I don't know how this pro progressed from that to that, but he starts talking about the chamber. And he had found a chamber, I, I want to say it, it was up on the hill, but I don't remember that. And that it had cedar beams and there was a chest in there. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. I mean, like, you know, if you can get some evidence of this, I'm sure somebody's going to want to back you. And and then he then he brought out that he he felt that he brought found the lost covenant of the ark. And I'm like, okay, you know. And I asked him how he thought that it was the covenant of the lost ark. And he said, like, when he's taking a shower, blood would come out of the shower head. And he woke up on more than one occasion with blood on his pillow. And that he, um, you know, ever since that he found this chest, but he never did say that he opened it. Um, he just said that he found it in a, in a cavern and there were cedar beams and he kept, the cedar beams were important to him that was in the room. And that's what I believe he thinks that he found the lost, the ark, I guess, the covenant of the ark. It's, you know, it's one of those stories, man, never goes away. <laughs> he swore there was some stuff up in there, uh, but then they fenced it all off and said, nobody can go back in here. That's it. Done. Nobody's drilling no more holes. Nobody's tearing anything up. And they blamed it all. They, you know, they used the, the uh, reasoning of private lands and you just destroy and stuff. But he wasn't doing anything. He was just going in there and poking around. You know, and it was difficult to get down in there. I, have you ever been up on that mountain? That's a scary thing, man. And, you know, I mean, there's, it goes straight down hundreds of feet. You know, he gets some attention in the media. There's some articles about him, but nothing really talks about what he claimed to have found. So he left behind a whole legacy of stories that he passed on to his own family members and that he left in interviews about what he found. And he claimed to have found a whole tunnel system on the mountain. And this tunnel system basically had various tunnels leading to a main chamber. And this main chamber, which he never made it to, but he was very confident, contained the Ark of the Covenant. He uh, basically mapped it out, spent a lot of time exploring, found a lot of intriguing things, old pieces of wood, hewn by man, as he said. Uh, he found seats of carved of clay in the tunnels with 
butt prints still on them. I found murals on the wall of a Spaniard and, and a, one of a Moor. Um, he, and he said, yeah, and he believed that basically that the Spaniards brought, and whether these are the same Spaniards on the Manila Galleon or whether this is a separate incident, he believed that they brought tunnel diggers along who were Moors from North Africa. And that basically the idea was these expert tunnel diggers helped to dig this network of tunnels where these very valuable treasures, including relics, could be hidden away. And one of the things I always think, just in all fairness about this, because it's easy to just say, oh yeah, whatever. I think it, there's a lot of plausibility to this idea. I mean, we're talking about a world in the 16th and 17th centuries where basically people might find a coastline like this and think, this is a great hiding spot and no one's really gonna come looking for it here. And who knows, maybe one day we'll come back here and establish this for ourselves. And if they're renegade monks breaking away from the Catholic Church, then they also might have another level of of motivation, which is if we have the Ark of the Covenant, then we're gonna be in control one day if we wanna establish our own place. So all that, I think, you know, just to give a little credence to, to Ed Fire's ideas, it's not totally out of the realm of possibility. So he left and pretty much he left, you know, kind of, what would you say? Uh, it, kind of, it wore him out, it ran him down. You know, there that, that was a lot of effort, like as there often is with, treasure hunters with these kinds of true believers, right? It's like you put everything into it, your time, your money, your energy, your hopes, you bring your kids along and then they think, sweet, it's only gonna be a matter of time and we're gonna be rich or we're gonna have all this you know, amazing discovery to share. And then it doesn't happen, right? So it's, it, it can be quite devastating. And I think his, he and his family were devastated by that. I mean, it was just the enthusiasm with which he did. And I mean, he never gave up. And I, I would never have had the gumption to go in and say the things to the, the people that, you know, that, that and, and I do think, and granted, you don't take a bulldozer down on the beach and start digging it, let's, and, but I do think that it seems like he had a lot of hurdles thrown in his way of, of, of doing, of, of pursuing this. And I think, frankly, I would love to have seen him be able to go ahead and, you know, are there really tunnels up there? You can quote me on this. Are you recording this? You can quote me on this. I have deciphered the code. I have found the system in the ground corresponding with the Neocani stone tablets. They are no longer rocks no more. They are legitimate tablet. And you can quote me on this. It will come up. That treasure's going to come up. You can also quote me on this. The Neocani tablets are genuine. This is no longer a legend to me. I have proven that the legend is real. And then he disappears from the record almost entirely. I mean, he gets to the point to where like his kids are trying to find him and they don't know where he is. You know, they don't have a phone number, an address, anything like that. So he uh, he dies. He dies penniless. The and curse of the treasure. It's absolutely the curse of the Neocani treasure, which everybody that tries to get involved in this shit falls <laughs> into, Tony. <laughs> We joked around, but the following week, I got laid off from work, a job I had for 10 years. Maybe it was all true, the curse. Maybe I was never supposed to be a part of this. Maybe a spirit out there does not want me to document this. We took a break. We went on with our lives. Then I found myself visiting an old friend again. My friend whispered, nostalgic memories. I sat and listened. I could hear it speaking the truth. The story was not over. I needed to go to the cave.
The treasure was the experience of the hunt. The treasure was the spark of imagination that re-emerged and insisted that there really is more out there. I saw sights I never knew existed. I experienced the magic of nature firsthand and also the hardships that life drifts upon our very own shores. It was all part of it. The nostalgic sentiments a kid's adventure movie from my youth had re-emerged and it brought along the joy from long ago. I felt like a kid among friends as we heard stories of lost pirate treasure. I'm here to tell you, there is a Manila galleon out there and it holds riches. But here's the catch. Time has spread the riches into nature and to find it, you only need two things. Not a map and a shovel, but love and respect. And I did find treasure out on the coast. It was a feeling I had not felt in a while. A feeling of being home. <laughs>